So the Jews have left Egypt and we're told that Moshe, Moses' father-in-law Yisro, goes out to the desert to meet him. Rashi, the great commentator, points out that that is an unnecessary detail, it would seem. We know exactly where Moshe is. So why does the Torah have to tell us that Yisro is going out to the desert? So Rashi explains that the Torah is praising Yisro because he was living amidst worldwide honor. He had everything. Honor, wealth, fame. He was the high priest of Midian, but he left all that behind because his heart inspired him to go to a desolate place, to the desert, to listen to words of Torah. For us, that's a recipe. You want to figure out how to study Torah? Leave everything behind. Wealth and fame and honor and ego and material trappings. Leave it all behind. When you pray to God, you're talking to Him. But when you study Torah, He's talking to you. One of the singular pleasures available in the world. And if you haven't availed yourself of this, it behooves you to do so, is to go out and meet, even if it's for a brief meeting, one of the great Torah sages. We have unfortunately lost several of our luminaries in recent years, but there are still many Torah sages that are alive. It may require a trip to Israel, may require you to go to Jerusalem or to Bnei Brak, but I guarantee you the experience will be worth it. And what's so striking in almost every one of these instances, if you go to meet a gadol, a Torah luminary, is just how spartan and how modest their surroundings are, how humble their homes are. Someone once visited a great sage many years ago, and the visitor was very wealthy. And he said to the sage, I just don't understand it. How can a rabbi who's so famous, who's such a big man amidst the Jewish people, live in such, such poverty, such modest surroundings? And the rabbi responded, I'm just passing through here. That's all I'm doing here. And so not only will you be struck by how modest the surroundings are, but you also won't help but be struck by how humble the people are. When you're talking about our great sages, you're talking about fellows who have the entire Torah and the Talmud and the commentaries at their fingertips. You're talking about minds that are as close to computers as human minds are going to get. If they weren't in the rabbinate, who knows where they'd be? Captains of industry, inventing cures for diseases, winning Nobel Prizes. But they're where, where they are because the Jewish people need them in their roles. But you'd think that somebody with that kind of a towering intellect could have a little bit of ego, a little bit of hubris. But the opposite is true. They're the most humble people you'll ever meet. And it makes sense if you think about it. Because the more you get into the mind of God, the more you study Torah, the more you appreciate the distance between the human and the divine, and the more humble you become. And so it's not counterintuitive at all that Moshe in the Torah is described as both the only person who ever spoke to God face to face, and also as the most humble person who ever lived. I once took a friend who grew up in an area with very, very few Jews and had very little Jewish background, who certainly never met anyone like a great Torah sage, to meet a great Torah sage. And he went in, it was a brief meeting, they exchanged a few words, they shook hands, the Torah sage gave him a blessing, and when we walked out, my friend had this mixture on his face of shock and awe, and he asked me the following question. In that apartment, were there spotlights? I said, what are you talking about? There were no spotlights. There were regular lights. Why do you ask that? He said, I'm telling you, that man was glowing. And I explained to him, don't be surprised. That's the light of Torah. Mm -hmm.